Okay, um, so we are nearly ready to start. The last check, I see that Christina is now here and we can see her in camera. So uh, we are all ready to start, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, we are just on time and uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you connecting from different parts of the world and welcome to today's event, uh, Welcoming the Stranger, which is focusing on exploring the role of faith actors in protection of internally displaced persons. You may know that this webinar is actually part of our monthly thematic discussions, and many of you already participate, but today is really special. Why is it special? Because uh, this session takes part within the Global Protection Forum, and this was really on purpose. Why? Because we want to make sure that this topic is so important uh, can reach out to as wide audience as possible, even beyond our human rights engagement task team. And then it can eventually also trigger or maybe inspire some of you uh, to engage with wider spectrum of actors beyond our traditional counterparts and keep our minds really open in terms of our protection advocacy and protection interventions. You may know that our uh, task team on human rights engagement is a bit special because actually beyond the uh, more traditional uh, co-chair of UNHCR, we have two co-chairs uh, in this task team who are faith-based actors, World Lutheran Federation and Sokagaka International. So we felt that we would like to transmit uh, this experience and uh, uh, added value of the task team to all of you also in the field. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we will uh, briefly look at our agenda today. Uh, I will give the floor in a moment to Cecilia Jimenez Damari, who is the special reporter on human rights of internally displaced persons. And then we will have a very interactive and interesting panel with four panelists uh, who will share with us their experience and uh, insight on the work of faith-based actors in the context of internal displacement before going to really the interesting element that we want to hear from you uh, in terms of discussions, exchanges, uh, sharing uh, questions, examples from field, and we would encourage all of you to use the chat functions throughout this uh, event. I see that some of you already posted a short introduction about your function, but you can also use it for asking questions, uh, for asking uh, some elements, clarifications. We will be constantly monitoring the chat, and we will come back uh, to you in the plenary part, which is facilitated by William, who is the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. We will then conclude with closing remarks by Hayas and see next steps what we could do as a task team on this very important topic. So with this and without taking much of the time of a very precious time in this session, I would like to give the floor to Cecilia Jimenez Damari who is the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights of IDPs to share with us her opening remarks for this session. Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie, for um, welcoming me. And I hope I'm not a stranger to you. Um, but thanks very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation for me to be with you today in this very important thematic webinar and for giving me the floor. Um, my experience in the field attests to the importance of the role of faith-based organizations in human rights, in humanitarian work, and in development. As the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons, it's really my privilege to assert the theme of this event welcoming the stranger. This is an affirmation, in my view, of the solidarity in humanity towards displaced persons, wherever they may be. 
recalling that displaced persons have actually been forced or have obliged um, to seek safety and security in other lands, in other homes, be it in their own country or elsewhere, outside the countries where they used to reside. This theme, welcoming the stranger, resonates in fact with the fundamental belief that all humanity is one, regardless of religion, ethnic origin, color, race, and other discriminatory grounds. It is in this basic international norm of non-discrimination that we find a commonality with the role in the role of faith-based organizations or actors in humanitarian settings. Echoing the welcoming the stranger affirmation adopted by faith-based actors under the ages of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, an essential background to this event, we find stated there, and I would like to quote this because for me, it's a very important um, statement. Our fates demand that we remember we are all migrants on this earth journeying together in hope. Indeed, this event attests by itself, attests to that affirmation of faith. However, it is also an affirmation in my view as a lawyer, it's an affirmation of international law application, particularly international human rights law, as well as international humanitarian law when there is armed conflict. And this is a basic, both of these international law regimes has as a basic premise that all humans are born with dignity and rights. As affirmed by the Vienna Declaration on Human Rights in 1995, and I was privileged to have been a part of that with um, uh, representing as well many Asian, um, Asian Pacific uh, non-government organizations, including faith-based actors. Such dignity in rights are universal, indivisible, and interdependent. Thus, the role of faith-based actors goes beyond the faith as expressed by them, but these are translated into concrete actions in a humanity of strangers, nevertheless, welcome, so that we may not be strangers anymore. These practical, programmatic actions are usually found not only in the, ter in the form of commitments to such solidarity in kindness, but also in actual practice. This is essential in sustaining that dignity and rights, which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights prevail on. Indeed, since the welcoming the stranger affirmation has been drawn up by faith-based actors in humanitarian settings, much has actually developed in terms of ensuring adequate policies and programs on the part of faith-based actors and organizations, be it NGOs um, uh, or churches even, or even individual groups of people. The organization of, of this work has actually evolved to be more responsive and more relevant in the alleviation of sufferings, risks to human rights violations, and mitigating the vulnerability of such of displaced populations. In fact, in one groundbreaking article that studied faith-based organizations tending to the displaced in Kenya, I think this was an article way back in 2011, it found that such organizations, by providing diverse forms of practical, emotional, and spiritual support to internally displaced persons, in this case, actually facilitated the integration of displaced persons into their new circumstances, creating a sense of belonging and oneness. And importantly, that same article also argues that internally displaced persons have not simply relied upon the upon the externally provided support by the churches and the faith-based organizations, but in fact, the IDPs themselves drew upon their, quote, 
personal and collective sense of faith and religious belief to overcome the challenges compounded by displacement. In short, while recognizing the significance of assistance providing, provided by the faith-based organizations and churches to internally displaced persons or displaced persons in general, there is and should be a recognition of the ultimate centralization of the agency of the internally displaced persons themselves. Thus, enabling the political agency of political populations by the faith-based actors, as with all uh, humanitarian actors, through the participation of the displaced populations in decisions affecting them, and ultimately FBOs, faith-based organizations, enabling conditions to facilitate the IDPs taking into their lives, taking their lives into their own hands, translates actually into eventual partnership between the faith-based organization and displaced persons. In the end, for me, the welcoming the stranger affirmation, while may be necessary in the beginning, needs to develop as well into more gen genuine solidarity amongst the people concerned with the faith-based organizations and churches and which also balances the power in such displacement context. Friends, colleagues, we all know the current context of displacement worldwide and specific countries where we all work in, including faith-based organizations and actors. I don't have to deal with that. But with the numbers continuing to increase, the gravity and intensity of displacement making compliance with international human rights and humanitarian standards more and more difficult, we find humanitarian actors, including faith-based organizations, facing challenges and obstacles in such welcoming the stranger. Humanitarian access is more and more restricted arbitrarily. Funding is actually dwindling. Political space to operate is constantly challenged. And in fact, in so far as some faith-based actors or organizations are concerned, particularly churches, the role in humanitarian settings are sometimes regarded with antagonism, often with suspicion. Moreover, unfortunately, spaces established by such faith-based organizations may even be transformed from spaces of refuge to targets of violence. In this context, it is important for us to assert that there is also solidarity that must be asserted among humanitarian organizations themselves in self-regulation. This is really essential. And I see this event further attesting to that with the integration of faith-based organizations into the wider humanitarian community. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to hearing from the representatives of the faith-based organizations themselves on the work that they do, the challenges and their aspirations in welcoming the stranger. And of course, hearing from the participants themselves. The work continues in this, this growing more challenging environment. But I think that if we are also faithful to our own commitment, welcoming the stranger should also always be the norm rather than the exception. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for um, bringing our attention so skillfully and so powerfully to various aspects that are related to engagement with uh, faith actors and also reminding us some of the key 
concepts, principles, including the legal frameworks, but also solidarity, um, principle of non-discrimination and the faith, the hope that uh, is key in the protection of inter, uh, internally displaced persons and lead to increased resilience. Thank you so much, dear Cecilia. And uh, I would now like to pass the floor to Kate um, uh, from Islamic Relief Worldwide to guide us through the panel discussion and uh, advance us uh, in the session. Over to you, Kate, please. Thanks, Valerie. And yeah, thank you, Celia. You always speak so eloquently, but that was really, uh, really powerful and an excellent um, guide and uh, a tee up for our wonderful panelists who I'm going to introduce to you now. Um, so we're going to have four speakers and in this section, they're going to do a little short sort of presentation first and we'll try and get through as much as we can so that we can have a really good Q&A. So please, as Valerie said, do share your questions as we go through. So uh, we'll start with um, the wonderful father, Manuel Yukana from uh, uh, the Kapni Institute um, in, in working in northern Iraq. And then we'll go to my colleague Shukri Ali, who's uh, with us for coming from um, Mogadishu today, explaining about our work, Islamic Relief work there. Um, then we'll pass to Nobuyuki Asai from Sakakakai International in Japan, who's going to give us a really interesting insight into how um, faith-based organizations in developing <laughs> developed contexts work when there is an emergency displacement um, uh, situation. And then we'll go to Christina Garcia, who is um, the regional director for HIAS in Latin America and the Caribbean, who'll talk about the situation in, in a more broader regional perspective. So I don't want to take any much more, any more further time, I want to leave as much time as we can for our friends to speak. Um, but yeah, do bear in mind uh, Cecilia's call there, colleagues, to you know, talk about the challenges, talk about how we um, translate faith into action uh, and the importance of, the, of welcoming the stranger affirmation and what that actually plays out in, in, in the communities where you work. So Father Emmanuel, over to you, please. Lovely to hear from you. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good day, good evening to everybody. Thanks for the organization, organ organizers, uh, participants and audiences in this uh, very important exchange and uh, uh, meeting. On behalf of CAPNI, I would like to thank you for uh, having the chance to uh, learn from you and to share with you our experiences. Uh, I'm greeting you from the uh, most beautiful city, Dohok, in northern Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, the province of Dohok, which in one overnight in August 2014 became uh, from 1.3 million populated province to 2 million. So in one overnight in uh, first week of August, uh, every two uh, in, uh, citizens or individuals in Dohok, the third was uh, displaced. This became after this uh, mass uh, flee of uh, uh, people who were forced to flee uh, from Sinjal, Nineveh Plain, uh, because of the ISIS uh, terrorist uh, uh, and occupation uh, massacres, which were being done by that time. The, so it was uh, a man-made disaster. And being a man-made disaster, uh, it... Uh, <laughs> It can uh, be expected, unfortunately, like in what's uh, ongoing situation in Iraq, that it is a disaster with an open end, first of all. And second, that uh, the needs and the consequences of the disaster are beyond the material needs. Yes, we as CAPNI and other organizations had participated in life-saving operations to reduce to uh, uh, eliminate the needs and help the uh, people, the displaced people, to uh, survive. However, this was not enough and it's still not enough now, despite we are to an extent in return era, not displacement era, uh, because we, need, we were in need and we are still in need to address uh, the needs of people to restore the dignity. What happened to the displaced was not just they lost their assets, their uh, livelihood, their normal uh, life activities, schools, edu education, I mean, health, etc., etc. But they were targeted deep and injured deep inside in, uh, uh, as uh, human beings. So they were, um, I mean, attacked uh, in, in their dignity, whether in individual dignity or collective dignity, because what happened was, uh, unfortunately, targeting the 
uh, minorities based on their uh, religious or ethnic background. Yazidis, I'm uh, referring to Yazidis and Christians uh, mainly. So uh, this, uh, I will not go in uh, addressing uh, the meeting on uh, what uh, material support Kapni and others did, because this is very clear, but uh, uh, what was uh, our uh, more uh, concern uh, to restore and to say, help the community to uh, restore the, their dignity. So we are speaking about dignity versus charity. We were more involved uh, to, to support in, in dignity issues. So the, this was not easy and still it's not easy because uh, the, uh, the targeted uh, uh, communities uh, under ISIS uh, suffered a lot. And uh, now they need to be convinced that they have a future in their homeland. You know. This, therefore, we were more focusing, and still we are focusing on the education, because the displacement era was created, was and is still creating a lost generation, where thousands and thousands of children lost the opportunity to have a formal education. Therefore, we were uh, speaking and uh, working with our partners to facilitate and uh, provide the chance or the opportunity for the children to get their right for education. And speaking for education, also we went further because uh, whereas we thank all who supported in uh, dealing and addressing the outcomes of the consequence of our consequence of the disaster, we believe we need to address the deep roots of the disaster and fix it once and forever. And to our understanding and analyzing the situation of Iraq is that this um, targeted minorities, uh, uh, mainly non-Muslim minorities, I'm referring to Yazidis, Christians, who are targeted and still target, being targeted under ISIS and other fundamental groups, um, are being plucked out of the memory of the people. Therefore, the uh, community and education system is creating an optimal environment for such fundamental groups. I'm referring here, for example, uh, just to conclude and give to uh, other chances to my colleagues to, to learn from them. Uh, for example, in Iraq, we, uh, we are speaking about five, five non-Muslim minorities who do exist in Iraq before Iraq being an Islamic Arabic country. I'm referring to Yazidis, the Jewish, the Mandians, yeah, and the, uh, uh, of course, Christians. Uh, all those uh, minorities do exist, are indigenous people of Iraq and uh, uh, do exist in Iraq, uh, are they deeply rooted in Iraq, but nobody can believe that all those components of Iraqi textile are not introduced in the education curriculum. So the new generations of Iraq are graduating their gymnasium, are graduating their high degrees, academic degrees, but they are unaware of, of their next door. You can imagine that this, for example, this, this uh, very, uh, webinar brought us uh, from all over the world in, in one room. So we became an, a global village where we had to globalize every means, mainly technology, economy, but we, so far we have the challenge to globalize their values. But in Iraq, the uh, generation are graduating whereas they are not knowing who is their uh, next door. So therefore, dealing with education, we are also uh, working, hardly working, and we, uh, uh, we are succeeded to revise the curriculum to introduce those minorities in a positive way that they are part of the community, part of the society, part of the country, not just in, as historic, his, uh, in history, but in the present mm -hmm. and the future. Thank so I will, uh, I will close here to uh, give chance to my colleagues to learn from them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Father Mario. Yeah, I think that's that's so interesting, and hopefully we'll get uh, we'll be able to have more time to to learn a bit more about that that um, the experience that you've got there of you know of protracted and um, violent displacement over kind of many years for different reasons, and and how it can lead to an erasure of history, an erasure of communities, an erasure of indigenous communities which we probably also see in Latin America and other places as well. So really important um, um, work there. Thank you so much. Okay, Shukri, I'm going to pass over to you now to, to take a few minutes to explain about how um, your team there has worked with the imams and sheikhs in the network in Mogadishu over the last few years. Okay, thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you to everyone, the organizers, the participants and the viewers. 
Yes, as I have been told, please bring us Lee. I am Shukur Mahmoud Ali, working with Islamic Relief Worldwide and currently based in Mogadishu, and I am the area manager for Somalia. I'll be very brief because of the timing, and I will just specifically go directly to the roles of the imams and the sheikhs, the faith leaders, in relation to protection issues and the role they play in relation to faith perspectives. So the sheikhs uh, in Somalia, they are normally used as a change agent. And because of their trusted roles, they are important uh, partner to international NGOs and also local authorities because of their status. Faith leaders are also uniquely suited to provide links to local communities for those who have been internally displaced and those who are hosting them. So they, they act as a linkage or a coordinating you know, a body. So between the IDPs, the government, and the faith leaders, at the onset of, for example, in the, during COVID-19, there was a confusion and a lack of recognition. Leaders were unfortunate to spread the factual information, including IDPs in, for example, in areas, for example, like Baidoa, Berdare, Dinsor, Beledwey, Dengile, in Banadir, in Mogadishu. So uh, during this COVID outbreak, there was a lot of conditions. Some people were not believing uh, that there is occurrence of the disease and all those things. So they have been used as a, you know, as an entry point and they have been a very important people. So especially in relation also to protection. Uh, in Somalia, we have a networks of imams and chefs, and then we have also the community leaders. And uh, during Mogadishu, uh, we mobilize the imams and then they also train and they also they provide uh, key informations. Uh, we have uh, uh, many imams and many leaders. And we also have some famous like Sheikh Abdahayi, which is also normally used for social media and all those things to spread you know, the public health you know, aspects, especially on protection and all those. Then the faith leaders, they also give needs based on programming design using ex extra information they get from the interaction with the families. They also educate the communities and health sensitization programs on the effect of SGBV to women and the girls, including FGMs, and the severe negative effect it has economically and social within the community because of the culture. Then we also engage the faith based leaders to educate communities on inclusion of women and minorities in the social and decision making. Therefore, Islamic Relief Somali holds a session explaining the importance of gender parity, while faith leaders support Islamic evidences using the hadiths and all the Qurans. Islamic Relief Somali will also engage one of the most influential and outpost local sheikhs, Sha'ad Bihai, especially in our COVID-19 program, protections, and we also train some of the sheikhs to provide the cases so, you know, so that we are able to reduce the protection concern. Generally in Somalia, the faith leaders, they educate the communities on, on FGM, its origin, and one its dear consequence on the women and the girls, discouraging it completely since it has no base in Islam. Because, for example, the FGM and all these things has no any basis in the Quranic teaching and the Hadith. So what the faith leaders usually do is they give education in relation to the impact on the effect of the FGM and SGBVF. Uh, faith leaders in Somalia, so we also advocate for girl child education relating to female ashabas or the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, for example, his wife Asha, uh, the Prophet's wife Asha was able to narrate uh, more than 40,000 hadith in relation to, you know, girl child education, relation to protection and all those things. Even in the Quran and the hadith, there are so many surahs and hadiths and the verses which also explains more about protections. In relation to protection and social contact, faith leaders they also brought in to mediate between families returning from abroad and local communities. For example, in Somalia, during the war, there were many people who have gone to abroad and then they left their assets behind. And then when they have gone abroad, and then some of the assets were occupied by some other people. When they were, wanted to come back and get their businesses or assets or properties, some people were not you know, able to give them the access to their land and property. So the chefs and the faith leaders are also used as a mediation. So this, sometimes this is bringing some issue of the protections because of, of, because of the resistance and all those things. So they are used as a key entry point. Whereas the risk of is also high, also there's the, the loss of livelihoods, for, for example, forcibly transfer, as I have said, 
like the land and all those things. So the fields are also used to do some remediations and solve some of the problem. Not dignified and regrettable, but arguably better than what might happen without intervention, armed eviction gangs and good establishing partnership between authorities, faith leaders, and NGOs to attend IDB needs and rights. Because the IDPs has a lot, a lot of needs, especially access to land and all those things. So there's a kind of a coordination mechanism between the faith leaders and the government, the IDP, the clusters, and all those things at the land. At least they are able to coordinate together. Uh, on the other side, uh, but it's unfortunate that sometimes the faith leaders are also used on the other side of the coin. For example, uh, in case there is a rep. It's a culture, maybe, and you know, the society or the community, especially those living in the rural. Sometimes, uh, you know, the person, the perpetrator, is not given, you know, a good, uh, you know. So sometimes, what happens is the leaders they sit according to the culture, and then they call the faith leaders, and then they said, okay, we'll able to compensate. For example, the person who has been raped, and this, and sometimes we see that the faith leaders will also collaborate and because they don't want to cause any more grief analysis or any more harm. So sometimes they are used on, on the, the, the side of the negative aspect. So I think that is it from the presentation. But generally, uh, uh, protection is a concern, especially in the IDBs, because as we are speaking in Somalia, and I don't need to say this is statistics, we have over 2.9 million IDBs in Somalia especially in the major towns like Abaidoa, Beledwin, Berdale, Dinsor, and even here in Banadir in Mokshu City. And, uh, and we also have over 2,400 substandard or unplanned IDP sites in, across the Somalia. And the, the key challenges more so, especially on the IDPs, is access to land is a key issue on protection. Thank you so much. Over to you, Kate. Thank you, Shukri. Thank you for that overview. Um, just before I hand to Noboyuki, uh, I wanted to, I've just had a note from the interpreters that I'm too fast because I always speak too quickly. I'm sure Noboyuki won't do so, but uh, just a reminder to the speakers to try and speak as slowly uh, as, as you can. Um, I think really important, Shukri, there to note the uh, a role that the, the Imams and the Sheikhs play in, in, in Mogadishu as a kind of mediator uh, and the trust that, uh, that, the, that, they, that they build and they have with communities so that they can help to spread messages into really important protection messages, but also public health messaging in times of emergency context. So I think that's really interesting, and quite different um, a perspective in, in a different context. So over to you now, Nobuyuki, um, to talk to us about the 2011 tsunami response. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Yeah, I'm Nobuyuki Asai from Sokagaka International. Uh, Sokakai is a global lay Buddhist network. Yeah, origin is in Tokyo, and I myself uh, based in Tokyo. Yeah, many thanks for uh, uh, giving this opportunity uh, for this important event. Uh, my presentation is about our response to the earthquake and tsunami and the nuclear power plant accident in 2011. Uh, immediately after the disaster, Sokagakai conducted uh, relief activities. Uh, 42 of our uh, Buddhist centers accommodated about 5,000 evacuees, mainly in Iwate, Miyani, and Fukushima prefectures uh, shown on this map. About 90% of those IDPs were outside Fukushima. In Fukushima, particularly in the area close to the nuclear power plant, uh, the situation was much more complicated. Due to the radioactive contamination, the government forced uh, the people, to, local residents, to evacuate to remote places. So they scattered across Japan. Uh, generally speaking, the IDP stayed in shelter, including our centers, for about one to six months, and then gradually moved to uh, temporary housing or uh, vacant ap apartment rooms arranged by the government. Basic human needs. Uh, continue, uh, uh, continue to be met uh, to a certain degree, such as uh, food, housing, and education. But new challenges emerged, uh, such as isolated deaths, deaths and uh, discrimination against Fukushima IDPs. In terms of uh, isolated deaths, uh, for instance, when the elderly IDPs moved to a new place, they often lost human connection and tended to stay home at home all, all day long. Even when they got sick, 
nobody would notice it. And it would take some days or even weeks until his or her death was found. And discrimination against Fukushima IDPs consisted mainly of oral criticism, uh, bullying in schools, and online hate speech uh, that were caused by other people's fear of radiation and envying of them because the Fukushima IDPs received compensation or temporary subsidy from the TEPCO uh, that caused the power plant accident. During this resettlement and recovery phase, uh, we saw Kagakai formed task force teams in the prefectures and supported by the headquarters in Tokyo. The teams were made up by dozens of people in the central area of each prefecture, which engaged in activities such as home visits, providing medical services, and other assistance, including organizing memorial services for those who lost family members. Togakai members focused on encouraging, uh, giving encouragement, uh, often from the faith perspective, so that IDPs could manifest their own resilience. Next slide, please. Uh, for instance, uh, an inspiring story is from Kenichi Kurosawa, one of the local residents uh, in Miami, who lost everything due to tsunami. All through the night, he slept on a pine tree and came to our center on the following day. He faced severe depression for some weeks, but finally, in our shelter, he was inspired thanks to the encouragement and got determined to take action. He wrote a signboard saying, keep on going Ishinomaki, and this board became a symbol of recovery of the whole city. It is reproduced and displayed in the National Memorial Park that opened this March. FBOs, including ourselves, could address the mental issue from their own uh, viewpoint and expertise. I strongly feel that FBOs succeeded in preventing isolated deaths and promoted human connection in the areas they covered. Next photo, please. Uh, Soka Gakkai's another unique initiative was a music concert series in the region. The purpose of the concert was to encourage IDPs and to help them regain hope in their lives. Uh, before the COVID, uh, about 160 concerts were held that accommodated 60,000 participants. They were arranged through the consultation with the IDPs themselves. Most of them were held in small event rooms in the temporary housing unit, and traditional songs in the region were performed as well. Apart from that, about 20 Sogagaka members who left the nuclear power plant earlier voluntarily started a new initiative of encouraging all the members who left the area. Initially, they didn't have sufficient information on whereabouts of the 3,000 people, so firstly, they started to confirm it and contacted with each. They gave phone calls, conducted home visits, organized exchange events, and delivered their own newsletters. The emerging of IDPs, particularly from Fukushima, brought about various types of new human rights issues, such as the rights to a healthy environment and discrimination related to nuclear radiation. Some of them were regarded by IDPs as human rights violation and brought into court. In the midst of the disruption, the mental aspect tended to be left behind, or it was quite difficult for uh, NGOs to tackle. But uh, I really feel that FBOs uh, made a great difference. I hope this will be further recognized. In the society. Lucas, seriously, I'll call you. Please. Hello. Go ahead, Nobuyuki. We're still with you. We've been, was that, did you wrap up then? Sorry, I missed you. I just heard something on the line. <laughs> yeah? You oh, okay, yeah. That's all, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's so interesting. I love the uh, creative aspects and how um, you were able to support people who've been displaced, uh, you know, through mental health and uh, mental health awareness. Well, none of us particularly good at that. And it's such a, Cecilia um, alluded to it in her opening remarks as well, it's such an important role that sort of spirituality and solidarity can play um, when people have uh, faced ma uh, major trauma. So thank you so much for that. Really, really interesting. I hope we can hear some much more about it in the Q&A. So to hand over to our final speaker now, Christina.
Uh, welcome, thanks for being with us. And Christina is going to give us a bit more of an overview of a, a much more regional context with lots going on um, in Latin America. So I'll hand over to you, Christina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. And, and well, good, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, <laughs> everyone. Uh, and, and thank you for the organizers of this important event and also for inviting me uh, to be a speaker in this important topic. Um, I'm calling from Panama very early here, actually. Uh, so, so good morning for those in this part of the, of the globe. Um, uh, so um, here in LAC, uh, in the LAC, in the Latin American region, uh, the uh, displacement uh, situation is a very dynamic, actually, uh, very dynamic and uh, dynamical context. There are IDPs and also mixed migration flows all across the region involving refugees and migrants. Irregular crossing are, uh, have been increasing throughout the region in the past year. And most displacement routes are for people trying to reach uh, the US uh, is seeking international protection or a better future. Uh, some of them stay in border areas uh, where irregular economic activities are more accessible to them and some get deported along the route, bringing people back uh, to an IDP situation while they are waiting for the opportunity to restart again uh, the route uh, towards the north. Uh, in terms of displacement crisis and an IDP situation, we have uh, uh, displacement triggered by disasters or by uh, conflict and violence in, uh, in the north of Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, in Mexico, inside Colombia, of course, in Venezuela uh, or uh, in, in Haiti uh, as the most, uh, where the numbers are uh, the biggest uh, within, within the region. IDP situation in, in the LAC region is not an isolated situation or a standalone situation, but a part of a very uh, dynamic regional displacement uh, crisis that ultimately affects the whole continent. And addressing this comprehensively is imperative to be successful in, in, in the response. Uh, the application of international, international law, human rights law, uh, as it has been said by Cecilia, is imperative. And in fact, faith-based uh, organizations play a key role all across the region in welcoming uh, displacement population uh, in, in Latin America. So as the scale of the displacement crisis reaches historical proportions in this, in this part of the region, an unprecedented number of individuals are experiencing emotional distress and psychological problems. Forced displacement, uh, whether due to conflict, uh, persecution, discrimination, man-made or natural disaster, interpersonal violence, economic crisis, climate change, or other human rights violations that are affecting a lot of contexts in, in, in Latin America, may lead to severe experience of loss including the loss of relatives and friends, a sense of belonging, control and autonomy, and access to resources or um, education or economic opportunities. In recent years, the focus of uh, uh, the mental health and psychosocial support programs to welcome uh, the displaced population has moved uh, from a psychological uh, symptoms and their treatment and prevention to collective and contextual elements of consequence of adversity. This includes the understanding of the importance of the collective reactions to adversity and of social cohesion, social supports and identities in determining individual and communal well-being in humanitarian and displacement contexts. It also includes uh, the activation of context-specific multidis multidisciplinary support systems that build on existing strength of affected communities rather than limiting the intervention to provision of services to respond to the deficits created by the displacement crisis. So as a best practice, HIAS uh, strategies are driven by a human rights approach fully aligned with the global uh, technical standard conceptions affecting the EAS guidelines, for instance, on mental health. In the context of for displacement in Latin America, uh, our uh, MHPS's intervention, mental health and psychosocial support interventions, aim to create a safe space where people can build true constructive interpersonal relationships and begin to restore a sense of dignity, justice, control, and autonomy. Hayes believes that one of the best ways to promote mental health and well-being is to strengthen existing relationships, networks, and practices that communities use to cope and heal, thereby bolstering resilience. A supported and safe environment is essential to recovery from impact of displacement, violence, and emergency. 
HIAS approaches is designed to preserve and improve people's psychological well being and ability to function emotionally, socially, cognitively, behaviorally, but also spiritually. So at HIAS, we work with a wide variety of individuals and communities across, uh, across the region and across the globe, coming from different cultural and religious backgrounds. And the compositions of our teams also reflects this great variety in terms of faith identities. Our strategies are therefore not framed in a religious or faith-based scope. However, we are becoming increasingly aware of the importance of spirituality in the lives of some of those we seek to assist and of the potential value of exploring more effective ways of engaging with local faith actors in humanitarian and displacement settings. Equally, however, there is a concern about how to address these issues in a way that do not threaten humanitarian principles of impartiality and neutrality, nor risking heightening any existing religious tensions. While religion can be a powerful source of coping and resilience, it may also be used to promote harmful practices. Therefore, applying a human right lens to religion is also necessary. Religion beliefs or practices should not be used as a basis for waiving human rights standards, undermining protection, or giving preferential access to services. There is therefore a need for weighed strategies of local faith engagement in a manner fully mindful of the do no harm imperative. This involves uh, developing a deep contextual understanding of the role of religion and religious actor in each humanitarian and displacement setting. So in some contexts, for example, HIAS invites faith leaders for interfaith dialogues through group discussions, which includes issues such as how refugees who, uh, how the refugees or IDPs who need help ref are referred to them, what kind of issues they seek help with, the type of assistance faith leaders provide, the role that, that they play in assisting refugees or IDPs in, in this particular context, the way in which religion and spirituality affects the way of understanding and coping with uh, their challenges, the challenges that uh, refugees, IDPs uh, are experiencing, the relationships between uh, different faith groups in this area, in this particular context, or how faith leaders think that hayas or other actors or other agencies can actually better uh, assist uh, the needs of IDPs and, and refugees. So, that would be for, for my part for the moment. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Wonderful. Well done. It's a huge region, huge context to cover there. We gave you the hardest job. Um, so appreciate that. We just were on really keeping really good time and seeing some really interesting um, questions coming into the chat already. So I'm hoping colleagues have been able to sort of follow them so that we can, uh, William's ready to, to ask, uh, ask them to our panelists. I just wanted to capture very briefly a two second reflection. All four of you have spoken as a core critical element about dignity, the importance of dignity, the importance of psychological support, um, of, of wellness, of mental wellness, um, and and of, uh, of it, and how faith leaders are really and faith-based organisations and faith communities and an acceptance of just a knowledge of faith and of a sensitivity towards faith and the role that spirituality can play um, when when people have been uh, experienced trauma or when you're welcoming or communities are being welcomed you know for host communities as well so I think that's really interesting to hear that come out so strongly from all four of your presentations it links again to what um, Cecilia said at the opening so I'm hoping that some of the questions that are coming up in the chat and people are interested I think rightly in, in the challenges that we face as well right um, and there are many uh, um, um, as well as the opportunities so hopefully that can come into some of that really difficult work that you do and, and in the in the, the Q&A and we can look at like the, what we can learn from the challenges and how you've overcome them as well. So thank you, um, Valerie, William, I, I hand back over to you, Valerie, I think for the for you to hand over to William for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Kate. And as you said, uh, so much in there in the presentations we just heard and uh, we have been closely monitoring uh, the chat. Uh, so it's time to open up for questions and I will actually immediately hand over to William Shemani, uh, the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator to guide us through this segment of exchanges of getting more in depth on some aspects or some of the questions you have been sharing. So over to you, William. 
Valerie and colleagues, thank you so much for this um, much interesting uh, session that comes extremely um, intuitive to many of us and extremely counter intuitive to many others in, uh, in the sector and, and, uh, and of us. And I think the way the panelists today have, have presented the issues is, uh, is most uh, comforting in the sense of uh, uh, concrete uh, ideas, concrete understanding of the challenges and, and concrete uh, examples uh, of how, how to overcome them. Now I have the easy uh, and pleasurable role of not making conclusions nor answering questions, but play the role that, uh, that we play in the cluster, which is bring a group of experts together and, and create that, uh, that engagement. And I'm, I'm very happy that we have uh, the panelists with us. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I will uh, use the following uh, methodology. I'll ask a direct question to one of our panelists, but if any of the others want to interject, or add on that question, do so. Otherwise you will miss the train and I will start with another question with another panelist. So I will start with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Father Emmanuel. Um, your example and starting line of overnight, uh, 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 the, the community that you serve in uh, has grown exponentially. Uh, what would take usually decades in terms of growth is, uh, is quite powerful uh, to understand the kind of challenges we face, you face, uh, we, we face together. Um, but where I want you to, to be specific with us is how do we actually work uh, with communities where religion uh, predominates over law, according to the beneficiaries, according to the community, you serve. And that might be quite intuitive for you and your role to deal with that uh, uh, reality. Are there any tips and uh, guidance and concrete ideas you can give us for, for other humanitarian actors on how do we deal with that reality? How do we transform what might initially come across as an black and white opposed, opposed ideas to, uh, to synergies and actually an enabler uh, for a humanitarian work. Father, uh, over to you on this question. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah thank you. Yes, uh, unfortunately it was a very unpleasant situation that in one overnight, the uh, host community of 1.3 uh, million uh, to have to host another 700,000 people in uh, individuals uh, who had left in one overnight, lost everything, even the clothing, even, uh, so it was uh, a challenge. I mean, not the, it was beyond a material challenge. It was um, an ethic, ethic and moral challenge. Uh, thanks God, thanks God uh, that uh, the uh, religious leaders in the host community, I'm referring to the church, to the mosques in, in Dohok, they were so uh, uh, cooperative. They were so open, open mind, open heart. That uh, in the sermons, uh, in all over the church and in the mosques, the, the uh, doors were being opened to accommodate and uh, facilitate the, the accommodation of those uh, displaced people. And there were uh, calls and initiatives that the host community came to share came to, to, to share the food, the clothing, the bedding with this uh, uh, huge amount of displaced who were uh, uh, sleeping on the, on the streets, on the uh, side of the streets, under trees, and in, in the very hot summer in, in Iraq. And all this. So the, I would say that the lesson we learned that uh, despite there are people or groups, fundamental groups, who are misusing the religion uh, to attack and to uh, practice violence and terror, uh, but uh, we have we can invest and we can have religion as principles, as values, and religious leaders uh, to build the bridge to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And this is our task as a, a faith-based organization that uh, to build bridges between the communities, not building walls. 
and this was a very ex uh, successful experience here in Iraq. Uh, for us, CAPNI uh, was, uh, 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 we are committed to that because since 28 years, we are motivated by, by our motto we, uh, to keep the hope alive. And to keep the hope alive, it's not uh, just an emotional sermon that I have to give in Sunday service, but I, I have to materialize a hope in a meaning that the people can uh, touch it. And also we are very much motivated in that uh, era in August, uh, starting August uh, 14 and the rises, that uh, we were recalling the Holy Family, Jesus and the Holy Family, they were neither terrorists nor tourists to Egypt. They were refugees who take refuge and seek, uh, safety in, in, in Egypt. And they were welcome there. So we were coming and the uh, church were being opened, mosques were being opened, herds were being opened. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Father. Especially for the for the last example as well that uh, that put things in in context. Let me turn to you, Shukri. Uh, often, uh, as as asked in um, in the chat box, the humanitarian actors are were nervous about how do we engage with faith actors because uh, uh, we most of the times uh, do not come from the communities themselves. We come as international players. Uh, and we, are, we, we have this uh, click in our head that if we work close to faith actors, um, we might be seen as non-neutral, non-partial. Uh, and, and that's a reality. Uh, that's a reality that uh, many of the humanitarian staff feel. So how should we deal with that uh, when we know that the facts uh, are not uh, aligned to that theory, but that strong perception that, it, uh, that exists? Uh, give us a couple of examples from your experience on how do we counter uh, that narrative and how do we reassure uh, um, uh, our programs and staff that actually investing in collaboration with faith actors and uh, uh, acknowledging the humanitarian dimension of faith actors is a great asset for achieving uh, the humanitarian outcomes that we that we want. Shukri, over to you. Okay, okay. Thank you, William. Uh, I think what you said is fact. Uh, and in Somalia context, most of the international NGOs or national NGOs, they work through the, the local staffs. And you will see that uh, the staffs are working in a very deep rural areas, for example, Baidoa, Beletwe, Bertale, Binsor, or any part of Somalia, whatever it is. So what happens is usually that uh, when you are doing the recruitment, for example, you should also able to contextualize. Because in Somalia, people are living according to the context. So what happens is when you do your recruitment, when you do your intervention, you must able also to contextualize in relation to the definitely to the objective uh, of the organization and to the donor perspectives. But you scale down your activities and everything towards contextualizing it. And then when you are able to recruit a local staff who is able to understand the local dialects, who is able to interact with the community, who is able, who is being trusted, who is well known, he will have, you know, automatic entry, a ticket, automatically a ticket to, to the community. Then on the other hand, the faith leaders now, you use them as an entry point. For example, there was a question that was asked by Miriam, a specific activities and initiatives which is developed to overcome uh, xenophobia, fear, and discrimination. If I may make a reference to that, is for example, the faith leaders are used to create awareness through public address system. For example, in some part of Somalia and even in Somaliland, you will see that the vehicles which are enacted with the public address systems and they are able to provide breaches, especially the rights of the IDPs, especially on protection, on rape, on you know, PCA and all those things. And they go around, you know, you know, they go around educating the people on this. And then you also do sensitization, especially uh, the, during the prayer times, like uh, the gym. These are Friday sessions. So the faith leaders are also used to provide a sensations 
uh, and then they will help to get this information. And then the other most important thing is the capacity building. This is empowering the community. This is the most important things, especially for sustainability. Then you also form a kind of a lobby groups that advocate for the rights of these people who have been displaced or especially people who have been, you know, their rights are denied. So you create a kind of a lobby group, you train them, you empower them, whether it comes to written activities and all those things. And then there is other tasks you can also do is you form a special commission. For example, like by Noah, there's a commission for IDPs. The government has formed this commission in some places. So there is an interaction between the IDPs and the commissions. And for example, the, the clusters, the protection cluster, the CCCM and all those things, is that, that kind. And then the other most important is how to do integration of this community. We have the most community. So you need to, you need to provide an integration of the IDPs to the host communities. By this, we will be able to improve a kind of social, you know, taxes. This will improve, for example, intermarriages, and we will be able to see that people are living, you know, very happily together. Yes, thank you. I don't know whether I was able to answer your question as needed. Absolutely. Thanks for 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 also being being concrete. I want to 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 build on what you said and and move uh, to Christina for a moment. I mean. You said that uh, religion could be a solution, but must have a human rights lens. Fantastic sentence. Give us something concrete. How would that look like in reality? You know, the religion, whether Christianity or Islam, uh, the religion okay. is very clear. Yes, yes. Shukri. Yes. Can, I, can I give the floor to Christina to try? Yes. And then if oh, you yes, yes, add, yes, sorry. Answer, yes, go yes, ahead. yes. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you, William, and thank you, Suki. Maybe you also have more insights to, to the answer after my... So a concrete example. Uh, um, one of the, uh, of the most important things uh, uh, when applying the human rights lens is, is uh, to uh, be clear that any, any assistance we provide, any program we, we deliver has to be in accordance with the, with the law, with the, with the human rights law, with the international humanitarian law, if we're in a conflict situation, with the international refugee law, et cetera. When coming to, to, this, uh, to your question, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the programs that we deliver at HIAS, as I was saying, are not based on a faith or any religious beliefs. Uh, however, it's very important that we also consider the beliefs and the religion beliefs and the faith of the people we uh, set to assist. So uh, for that matter, it's important that this combination of uh, um, uh, helping people to rebuild their life in dignity and have this sense of uh, normality, which includes also uh, the practice of their religion beliefs uh, in the new uh, place where they have been forcibly displaced, is also an important part of, 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 the, of the rebuilding uh, the life uh, of, of those that has been displaced in um, uh, uh, forcibly displaced in a new in a new setting. There are many examples, such as, uh, for example, intercultural dialogues with different faith-based organizations. For example, in LAC, uh, we work a lot uh, in partnership with uh, uh, Catholic-based uh, uh, actors uh, that are part of the, I mean, of the safe spaces uh, where they welcome a lot of displaced population all across the region. Uh, um, the, the, the coordination with all those actors and then uh, the fostering of the humanitarian principles and the human rights uh, law uh, uh, together uh, with all the faith actors or non-faith actors, actually NGOs, local authorities, it's, it's, it's imperative to, to, to foster this sentence that uh, we need to uh, provide a humanitarian a human, an, an, a human rights lens to uh, uh, to the religion or the faith base that we uh, that we provide. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Or if Suke has any more insights <laughs> to that, thanks, thank Christina. Uh, before I give the opportunity to Shukri, let me let me continue with you, Nobu Yuki. Uh, no, no, I think that's fine. Uh, the response to me is fine. Thanks so much. Thank yes. you, thank you, yes. Nobu Yuki. Let's turn to, to 
to you. I think we're sometimes from a hum international humanitarian organizations, we're very self-centered. Uh, and um, we have a lot of uh, passion to talk about the challenges we have to work. But with your experience and your organization experience, can you give us a sense of the types of challenges you face uh, in operating in a humanitarian environment because you are a religious organization or a faith-based actor? Uh, how does it how does it look from your viewpoint? What are the types of challenges you face, and how can we help overcome them? Over to you. Yeah, thank you, William. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for ourselves is that uh, the both national and local governments or or other uh, or many uh, entities are basically reluctant to work with uh, FBOs in Japan, and uh, uh, the the principle of separation of church and state is also really, really strictly interpreted uh, in Japan. So uh, we are not often regarded as uh, uh, one of the members in the community uh, for the humanitarian affairs. But in reality, of course, uh, many uh, FBOs are working on the ground. So yeah, uh, we hope to be, I hope to join a kind of uh, common platform uh, for promoting dialogue, uh, promoting uh, better uh, pre preparation uh, for uh, better protection. Yeah, that's the uh, initial point, I feel. Yeah. Thanks. I want to, to, to open the, uh, the opportunity to, to dwell a bit on the, the types of challenges you face and how can the humanitarian sphere uh, support and overcoming uh, to to the rest of the panelists. Any ideas anyone would like to add? If yeah, go ahead, Father. Yeah, uh, I would speak from our experience in here in Iraq that uh, unfortunately we uh, lack. Uh, any interface platform, which is very much needed to address uh, the, the challenge of uh, such a diverse of faiths that we had in Iraq. We have almost seven or eight uh, ethnologists, uh, different ethnologists, uh, ethnologists uh, communities. But unfortunately, so far we uh, lack such a platform. Therefore, I think I think uh, it is very uh, important for uh, faith-based organization to advocate to advocate for such uh, a platform, uh, interface platform, I mean, uh, to train uh, young people to have uh, programs uh, for the young generation to from different backgrounds to come. We should not rely, I'm speaking from uh, for Iraqi experience, uh, we should not rely on the gover governmental uh, plans, uh, unfortunately, because uh, uh, such a country like Iraq there is a supreme status for uh, a certain religion and uh, uh, constitutionally and uh, in, in legislation, the other um, uh, religious uh, faiths are considered as second, uh, are discriminated on the level of law. So therefore we should uh, invest in, in, uh, 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 in generation and the informal education this one, for example, one of the activities we, we do have. We have five children's centers, bringing children from different uh, backgrounds, uh, sharing their daily life together, sharing activities, indoor activities, classes, and outdoor activities, uh, celebrating the, the religious uh, face for all together. Uh, we should invest in such activities, in, uh, I mean, uh, informal education and uh, advocate for an interfaith platform uh, based on not uh, to to come in theological discussions, no, but uh, to to uh, agree on some uh, kind of uh, uh, living together in a mutual respect that unfortunately we uh, we lack so far in the country of Iraq. I'm speaking. Thank Thanks, you. Father Christina. Over to you. Thank you. No, I was I was just going to add um, that uh, to overcome these challenges, it's, it's key to uh, have a deep understanding of the context, including uh, the the particularities uh, of the religion's beliefs in that particular context, 
and also to empower communities so that they are the ones driving the response. And then whether this is a faith-based organization or a non-faith-based organization that is actually responding to the situation, if you are responding with empowered communities with a deep knowledge of the context, they will be the ones driving the response. So hence the faith uh, uh, particularities or challenges uh, are not applying anymore. William, there you go. Well, you were muted, William. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, you're all good. good. Okay, I think we're we're getting to the. Uh, uh, did you want to say something, Kate? I mean, I put my hand up. I'm only being cheeky if we've got time. <laughs> go ahead. I, I mean, as moderator, I just wanted to. Uh, address a couple of questions in the chat and really just echo what my colleagues have said. I mean, I, I, um, I very much have an overview of this globally. I'm not a, a field um, actor. I'm not even a person of faith myself. I, I, am, um, I am just very privileged to work in an organization that is very, very open to really all beliefs and, it, and more open, I have to say, in some ways than the secular humanitarian organizations and NGOs I worked for for most of my career. I think just going to Nina's question in the chat, you know, but she asked two questions. Um, one about uh, specific uh, <laughs> challenges that we face because of our faith identity. I, I, I mean, Islamic Relief can answer that question offline, but there are lots of them and lots of them. Um, there's probably lots of them for lots of other colleagues as well. Um, they're kind of, they're broadly similar to political challenges that NGOs and humanitarian organizations face in very, very difficult crisis contexts, full stop, right? They're not very much different, really. They're, political, they're politically motivated. In terms of the second question, William, and I think it comes to some, some of what my colleagues have been saying, um, given, you know, different beliefs uh, and be all beliefs and none, you know, how do we ma maintain neutrality? Well, we do that in the same way as every humanitarian organization maintains neutrality. We're not different. Right, everybody has their beliefs, every individual, every organization and can be aggressively dogmatic actually sometimes in the secular humanitarian sector, you know? This, some of the problems are that I think we need to get past that as humanitarians, as secular humanitarians and realize that our principles as another colleague posted in the chat are very much in line with a lot of faith, messages of faith and messages of the religious doctrine. But the, the problem is the kind of interpretation when politics gets involved. And that was just the final point I wanted to make when I was talking to Shukri and, and colleagues and helping them to prepare for this session. They were saying about how just last week or 10 days ago, they were sending me the Global Protection Cluster updates from a recent displacement situation in Somalia, which is being exacerbated by local religious leaders who are uh, talking about you know, tribal violence and encouraging violence, right? And in that situation, we wouldn't mobilize the network of imams and send them in to try and help defuse it because it would make things worse. So it's about, as, as Christina just said, being super aware of your context, talking to the people who are leading in the context and responding as an NGO uh, and a humanitarian actor on the, on the back of that context and being really practical, right? So I think I think that's that's what really inspires me about talking to people like Father Emmanuel, Nabiu, Christina, Shukri, and my colleagues. You know that they have this very practical um, uh, knowledge that is slightly different, I think, and, and a slightly less fearful or perhaps less tied up in 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 in, in, in prejudice or, or past uh, past bad experiences. And, and hopefully we we're going somewhere to help. Um, move us forward together in, in, in thinking of different different people that we can engage with when it comes to dealing with these super tricky, heavily politicized situations. So thank you for that moment, just to have a little word. Good, good, good. Thanks a lot. I think it's, it's probably um, one of these discussions that, um, that can uh, create a lot of questions, create a lot of answers. Uh, and uh, can um, keep going for, for a while. And I think that's the point of having um, these partnerships. Uh, we in the Global Protection Cluster uh, definitely have very strong uh, membership in the cluster, both at national level, and as you've heard from, uh, uh, from Valerie, um, globally in our global uh, structures. And we, uh, find the, uh, the collaboration 
uh, very solid on many fronts, um, including on uh, one key priority for us in the cluster, which is um, ensuring that um, protection response is locally driven. Having faith-based actors um, engaged in the, uh, the way we do coordination of protection in the villages, in the camps, in the urban centers um, is extremely important. One, because it works. And two, because if we don't, we're missing out on a huge opportunity of a structure and force for good that exists. And we, uh, we can benefit from to, uh, to meet a humanitarian and protection outcomes. Let me close by ending back for, uh, uh, to Valerie by uh, a story uh, of, uh, of two religious uh, uh, persons uh, who were uh, together uh, on a terrace overlooking a fantastic lake uh, and uh, um, praying and talking and walking and, and having a moment of peace uh, for themselves. And one day, one of these uh, two religious persons, one person was smoking uh, a cigarette. Uh, and then the other person saw him and say, how are you smoking uh, in this religious place and this uh, the smoker responded said well I asked my supervisor and the supervisor agreed and he said the supervisor agreed for you to smoke the person said indeed the supervisor agreed and then this uh, this other person went and asked the supervisor his supervisor uh, to smoke and and then of course he got a very negative answer what are you talking about smoking and then he came back and he said, well, I just asked my supervisor and the answer was negative. He said, well, it depends on what did you ask? He said, what did I ask? I asked uh, if I can uh, uh, smoke while praying. And he said, see, it's the wrong question to ask. Go back and ask, can I pray while smoking? And I think this, uh, approach of praying if it works for smoking for something as bad as smoking it definitely would work for something as good as a humanitarian action so from where we stand uh, the relationship between a humanitarian action and religion seems obvious it's powerful it reinforces each other and i hope we in the cluster can build on sessions like this to prove that in practice on the ground. So thank you everyone and for all the questions and all the panelists and over back to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, William. And I think through this anecdote, you have really triggered some uh, important thinking and how we take it forward. And I, again, thanks to all panelists and uh, I'm aware we could not answer all the questions in the chat, but it helps us, the task team, then to see how to take this topic also forward. What is of your interest? How to shape it? So I just want to acknowledge also all participants. Before I give the floor to Rafael Marcus uh, from Hayas, uh, the senior vice president of Hayas, to give us the closing remarks, I would like to share already the final evaluation link, and it will come also in the chat so that you take the few minutes before uh, we get until the end of the session to reflect on this session. And please really take as an opportunity after all this very rich discussion and examples, how we can be of use, any recommendations to the task team or to the global protection cluster, what are the elements that you would like to follow up on or have more discussions and we are here available. So again, uh, you will receive the link in the chat, but it is not yet the end. And I would now uh, like to give the floor to Rafael uh, to give us some final reflections. Over to you, Rafael, please. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, first of all, I, I really want to th 
start to off by, by thanking each of the participants for their sharing their wisdom. Thank you, Valerie, for leading. A special thank you also to UN Special Rapporteur Cecilia Jimenez Damari for a compelling keynote speech. Kate for the moderation and to Global Protection Cluster Coordinator William Shamali for facilitating the discussion. A special thanks to all panel members for their input today and for the services you provide on a daily basis to relieve suffering of displaced persons and their host communities. As is pointed out in the high level report on IDPs, the issue of internally displaced people suffers from a lack of appreciation in general, and more specifically in terms of the costs of inaction when it comes to assisting IDPs. I am just back from a mission to Honduras and it was impressive to hear the stories of multiple displacements and the fact that the internal displacement is often just the first step to a more prolonged displacement story within or outside the country. So we need to step our, up our game. We know that and we are thankful for the report to, that pointed that out. And we have heard once again that it is not only IDP situation that are not yet fully acknowledged, it is also the faith sensitivity and the importance of it that needs to be enhanced, both within FBOs and non-FBOs. So we have heard today many compelling examples of how important faith is in various ways. Cecilia pointed to the important agent of faith for people overcoming difficult situations and in building resilience. That is the personal strength drawn from faith. Father Archimedes Emmanuel elaborated on the important faith has for dignity and also how our work with different faith communities relates to the importance of ensuring rights for minorities in general. Shukri Mohammed spoke more to the operational importance in engaging with faith leaders and how it can be an important entry point if it is for work around COVID sensitization or GBV and other protection concerns. And Nobuyaki Asai spoke about the importance to provide IDPs with their religious needs, such as memorials and the ability to grieve and the importance to relate to the spiritual aspects of faith within the population of concern. And Christina Garcia continued along this line relating to the importance of the faith background and the existing network, often faith-based, for providing coping mechanisms, but also the importance of the deep contextual understanding of the role of religion in settings to ensure that the do no harm principle remains paramount and is not compromised. The discussion that followed then turned to the many challenges. William did not shy away of difficult questions regarding these challenges, and our speakers showed how eloquent they and their organizations are in addressing these. To sum up all this great input received, we understand how faith can be an instrument to reach people, an operational asset in providing fast and context sensitive assistance through networks and local capacities. And in my humble opinion, most importantly, a professional aspect to be aware of when working with clients to ensure accountability and the right approach for needs assessment and eventually the provision of support. And I think as we are virtually convening due to COVID, we saw this with the role of FBOs have played during the pandemic to stay and deliver and to really bring up the message of, of, of COVID, of relating to the people who, who were hit by COVID and also using the great network that they have. I want to add to all this the immense power we, as faith-based organizations, hold in advocacy specifically in interfaith work, as it is important to know that faith-based organizations are as diverse of a community as non-FBO agencies. Kate mentioned that a very important point, we know how FBO and non-FBOs are no different in their level of diversity when it comes to openness, progressiveness, and other characteristics. When we, as an organization from different religious backgrounds, talk together and advocate for change, we are able to create more awareness more impact. And this is why this session was so powerful and is so important. I want to close with one of the themes that I feel most compelled to lift up with my final sentence. It is of utmost importance that when providing assistance, the humanitarian community remains sensitive to the needs of IDPs, but in addition, that we remain sensitive to the spiritual needs of the IDPs. Eventually, it is less important who gives the service FBO or not, it matters whom we are giving services and how we remain attentive and accountable to their needs. So again, thank you so much for that really impressive session. I learned a lot. I hope all the participants learned a lot. 
I want to remind everyone again to fill out the evaluation form and wish all of you a good day, a good evening, and a good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael, for those closing remarks. I think you brought it all very well together and uh, really have been pointing the key aspects and also provided us a further guidance how, how to take it forward. Uh, so colleagues, we are at the end of our session. Um, uh, thanks again to all, not only colleagues who presented, but above all of uh, those who, uh, who join us from mainly deep field locations. So this is much appreciated. Uh, we will follow up as the Human Rights Engagement Task Team on the recommendations and questions that you provided. Uh, we want to hear from you uh, more, so please take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation and indicate there uh, what we can do more, better to support you. And uh, finally, I would also like to mention that if you are interested to know more about the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, our work, what we do, how it could be of use to you, please get in touch. We will post also in the chat our contacts and we would be happy to connect bilaterally as you deem useful and necessary. So thank you again and uh, have a good rest of the day. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Valerie.